And then one time, this kind of an embarrassing story. Holy cow, I think I just found my career. To purchase the company for 1.7 million. First, I have a confession to make. Hello, I'm Ron Senior, and welcome to another version of Healthcare Hot Topics. This is kind of a special version for us because we're going to be talking uh, with Professor Kristen Finn uh, from the Beasley Institute of Health Law at the uh, Loyola University Chicago Law School, of which everybody on this screen is a graduate of from the LLM program. And we're so excited to talk about why having an LLM uh, is essential or very, very helpful to practicing healthcare law. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Professor. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to spend this time to learn more about the Chapman Law Group and your focus and how your education and experience uh, in our LLM program at Loyola has really helped your career, helped you to serve clients better, and makes you a better attorney. Uh, I'd love to start with you, Ron, and hear about Chapman Law Group and your personal focus and career path and how your education has really helped you. Thank you so much. Chapman Law Group started 37 years ago, and uh, I started as a healthcare medical malpractice attorney. Um, I've been blessed with right after I got out of the government. Prior to that, I had a short government career, um, and then the person I worked for lost the election, and then I started practicing practicing law, but I was blessed with one major client, and that was a correctional health care provider. Um, 37 years later, we still have that client, and so we practice primarily uh, medical malpractice, uh, civil rights um, practice in the correctional setting. People could sue for a 42 USC 1983 violation if they didn't get the right health care that they could have, um, and then as part of that, we started having physicians come to us with other problems. Mostly it was a licensing problem. And then sometimes they would come to us with regulatory or other kinds of problems. Um, and then one time, this is kind of an embarrassing story, but this is a true story. In 2008, a client came to me um, and he wanted to open up a sleep clinic and he was concerned about a Stark violation. And this is the embarrassing part. 30 hours later, reading through about three books, I still had no clue whether he had a violation or not, and he left to go to another lawyer. And so we, we tried again, we started whatever. And then in 2013, uh, Ron and I were, were talking, and I realized, I think he did at the same time, because I'm not sure which one came up with the other, that I didn't know what I didn't know. And I figured I had to figure out a way to at least know what I didn't know, so I enrolled in Loyola, uh, I think in 2015, uh, graduated in 2016. Um, and I think the best thing it taught me, one, now I know what I don't know, but more importantly, it taught me how to spot the healthcare issues. <clears throat> and then it showed me where to go to find the answers. <clears throat> because I tell most of my clients when they call, I don't know the answer, partly because the law changes about every administration or every year. So if I knew it two years ago, it doesn't mean I know it today, but I know where to look. And that's what you're kind of paying me for. Um, and then we kind of developed this reputation of growing into this um, healthcare law firm of 18 attorneys. And that's all we do. We're divided into four divisions. Uh, we have a regulatory division that deals with state and federal regulatory issues. We have a compliance division, which deals with those compliance matters. Civil litigation division, which is still the nearest to my heart, dealing with key TAMs and, and medical malpractice and all of that. In a white collar division that Ron started when he got out of the Marine Corps. He was a prosecutor in the Marine Corps, uh, and he kind of started that. And all of these work together. So within healthcare, we've kind of become specialized. Um, in doing different things. And so the beauty of our firm is we can pass things off. Like, like yesterday, I had a client call me who really had a very serious compliance program, didn't call us until really late. And now it's a very serious criminal program. 
So the compliance part of it, whether it's an anti-kickback violation, whether ECRA is involved and all those things, I will work out and Ron and his team will handle all the issues with the FBI and the DOJ and you know all of those kinds of things. Uh, and we're able to, to share all that back and forth. So about 2015, 16, um, well, a little bit after, about 17, 18, we hired some other attorneys that knew healthcare law. Um, unfortunately, we had to let those two attorneys go. And I realized that unless you have an LLM, and I'm so prejudiced to Loyola, you really don't know healthcare law. You know maybe a small section of it, but you don't have the breadth of it. Um, you know, you can analyze the anti-kickback problem, but you won't be able to see some other problem, whether it's a Stark problem or whether it's just their compliance program isn't very good, you know, very good or other kinds of issues. And so we're proud to have all of the LLMs we have who all came to us in a different way, uh, but they all arrived here uh, and we have a pretty dynamic process and we're still looking for LLMs. Um, particularly Loyola, um, to add to our robust nature. Um, not to take away from our other 14 attorneys, they're very strong, they do a very good job, but you need an LLM to really analyze the issue in many of these things. Um, and so that's where we are. And uh, we have everybody else that's here and we're looking for more. And uh, we love what we do. Um, you know, we're in four we have four offices. We have two in Florida, Sarasota, Miami. We have the Detroit office, which is where we started. And now we have an office in LA uh, where we deal with you know, healthcare problems um, and we're growing. We have clients, give me an idea of how fast we're growing. We open about 82 new clients a month. And every one of those clients have healthcare problems. They can either be from a regulatory issue to a compliance issue, to a criminal issue, to a civil litigation, healthcare issue. Uh, and when I tell people that want to know what we do, I say, look, when I say it's only healthcare, it is. Your house could blow up and you could have a great claim against the gas company. We won't touch it. You can get in an accident or get in a divorce or whatever. We'll refer it out. We just do healthcare. Um, and we're really proud of what we do and we're proud of our education. Wow, that was a great description. Um, Thank you. I love it. So we have members of your team <laughs> are both graduates of the campus LLM program at Loyola and the online LLM program at Loyola. And we're really happy to have that flexibility for students to study online across the country, just like your offices are across the country. So it's obviously worked out really well. Um, and just like you, we see many lawyers who've been practicing a long time who realize that they need more specialized knowledge in a particular area. And um, for us, that's healthcare and often compliance too. We have an online LLM degree that focuses specifically on compliance as well. And so we see students who want to either up tool their degree, kind of reskill re up tool or pivot. Some people really want, have been practicing in one area and want to take a different path. Perhaps they had one healthcare client or um, other clients and they, and they really want to change course. And often those students want to go to the campus degree program um, for some practical experience and, and see what that's like. I'd love to hear from others about their experience with the degree program, about their area of law and how it helps serve clients. Um, how about, who would love to jump in? Why don't we start in. with Juan? I can jump in. So my name is Juan Santos. <laughs> I'm based out of the Miami office. Um, I'm gonna tell you how I ended up in the LLM program, which was basically the best choice uh, that I made in my career uh, as an attorney. So I graduated uh, law school 2010, passed the bar back home in Puerto Rico, and I was working in a corporate firm, and we represented many health systems. So Puerto Rico has three big health systems, and we were representing two of them, which is Auxilio Mutuo and the Pavia Group. And that's how I got involved with healthcare. I didn't even know that healthcare law was a thing. Uh, you know, usually you know corporate or you know criminal or you know, civil litigation. So I got introduced to healthcare through that uh, firm uh, that I used to work back in Puerto Rico. And around that time, the Obamacare 
uh, was being considered uh, and was at a point in time, I think 2012, 2013, during that time that it got approved and, and got enacted. And in 2014, uh, Puerto Rico was in a serious uh, financial uh, situation. Uh, we basically proceeded to go into bankruptcy. We had to negotiate all our debt. So I thought to myself, this is the perfect time to get out of Puerto Rico, expand my career and go to Loyola. I learned about the program from a Puerto Rican friend of mine uh, that completed the program the year prior, uh, the 2013, I went in 2014. So she was the one that told me that it was amazing, that this was what I had to do, that if I wanted to do healthcare, I should apply. So I proceeded to apply and I started in 2014 and graduated in 2015. I had the best professors to remember Professor Blum, Professor Singer, and what I learned at that point in time is that healthcare law, although it's a niche and it's really specialized because of the anti-kickback start laws and laws that are not in any other industry for that matter, that everything basically was a puzzle that everything ties together. So the most important thing that I do uh, and where I specialize is really compliance. However, you think about it, compliance is everywhere in healthcare. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about corporate transaction because I was a corporate attorney uh, prior to uh, going into the LLM. So I have a real uh, you know, case uh, that I, we retained a client two weeks ago, and I'm going to tell you how compliance is everywhere, specifically in corporate transactions. As LLM students may be aware, if they already took corporate transactions or compliance, when you're going to purchase a healthcare entity, different like to purchasing a restaurant or another business, you usually want to do it through a stock purchase agreement. Why? Because the company has licenses, certifications, third-party payer agreements, all of these agreements that the company already have, that if you do an asset purchase, then the, the client has to apply for new licenses, new certification, new provider agreements, and that will put the client in a position where they're not, they're not start, they are not going to start uh, operating and for that matter be profitable because it can take them 90 days up to a year to start entering into those uh, agreements, licenses and certifications. So as you learn in the LLM program, when you purchase this type of entity, you can do it one of two ways, asset purchase and stock purchase. Both of them have advantages and both of them have disadvantages. The advantage of purchasing the stock purchase is that you take over the stock, the company stays the same, you continue operating and you do what is called the change of ownership process, where you submit child applications to agencies, state and federal, so that they can do either what is called a stock transfer notification or a child application that will be approved. Now, what is the disadvantage? The disadvantage is that you take over the liabilities of the company. So as you may be aware, the government can go back six years and Medicaid is five here in Florida, but you can go back six years and they can audit you and the company will be liable. Now, it could be that the seller violated the anti-kickback and that seller is gonna to go to jail, but the buyer and the company is, is gonna lose its investment because if the government comes after them and they basically conduct an audit or an investigation and realize that you violated the anti-kickback statute, that means that that's a false claim. That means that you're gonna get penalized $15,000 per claim time treble damages. So you're probably gonna go bankrupt. So this real case that, that I'm currently working on, I have a meeting with a client at Ford to tell him some bad news. It's a DME company out of Illinois. He wants to purchase the company for 1.7 million. So I told him, I sent a due diligence checklist that includes financial records. The normal things of any business that you will look into litigation, tax return, financials, all of that. But for us, the most important thing are gonna be reviewing 1099s, W-2s, employment agreements, and see if these employees have been trained. So the first thing that I, that I took the task after reviewing the financials, I review uh, that there are no 1099s, but when I see the contract, they, only, they have 20, 20 employees, and they only, only sent me four agreements, two of them signed, Two of them basically just a job description. So I review all of the W-2s and when I realized that most of these employees are really sales reps that are getting business for the company and they didn't have employment agreements, contact the attorney and tell them, listen, I need employment agreement for all of these W-2s employees. 
when he sent me the records that I reviewed yesterday, we have independent contractors agreements based on commission volume of how much business that, that a sales rep or employee was bringing to the company. So when I realized that I contact the attorney, he sent me, you know, full employee records. There's no training. Many of them either have an independent contractor based on commission or there's no agreements for those employees. I review the W-2s from 2019 and 2020, and I see that all of the salaries vary. So one year, 2019, he makes 20,000. In 2020, he makes 100,000. Then I know he's a sales rep, right? Uh, so my client, although he paid off due diligence, you know, a, a retainer to conduct the due diligence, I probably gonna save my client $1.7 million. If they get audited and this company started in 2018, 2019, and they're billing millions of dollars to Medicare, so they're going to get audited uh, sooner rather than later. So knowing, thanks, thanks to the LLM, what to look for, how to identify if there's anti-kickback violations, although many clients want to just, hey, want to drop the agreements, let's go ahead and close. Uh, many of them, I explained to them that they're not buying a restaurant, et cetera. They're buying a healthcare entity and there's going to be many, many risks involved. So that client, although many of them say one, but listen, I just want to close and all of that. The risk is not worth the reward. In addition to that, if he wants to move forward, we will send him a letter where he will sign it and we explain the potential liability so that Chapman Law Group is covered and so that we did our job and we explained uh, what type of issues he may, they may arise, you know, even six years later. The other problem that the client could be facing that I'm going to talk to him in a little bit is that if he gets audited under Medicare, Medicare has rules and regulations where Medicare can suspend the privileges while a fraud investigation is being conducted. So if my client was billing a million dollars a year out of Medicare, then my client, I cannot do, if he's being uh, investigated and he's suspended, his channel to make the million dollars out of Medicare is eliminated. So the company right now is not worth a million seven, it's probably worth a hundred thousand dollars because of third party payers, private or Medicaid. So even if we were to defend that client, when the case, it could be a year, two years until that case gets heard under the Medicare appeal system, et cetera, and my client basically will, will, will go bankrupt pending the investigation, even if we were to win. So there's clear violations of the anti-kickback statute. If they get audited, I think they could go to jail. Uh, so that's something that, that I'm going to discuss with my client. So that's more or less how important it is compliance in corporate transactions, how we can provide advice to our clients and save them the investment that they believe that they're making when we realize that the investment that they're making could end up being zero and a lot of attorney fees, headaches, et cetera. Other thing that I do in the practice because I do compliance, I work with Ron the second regarding DEA investigation, white collar. Uh, we have a case of, of, uh, of an attorney, of a doctor in Puerto Rico uh, that I think we're gonna basically can dismiss the case based on technicalities. Uh, so I work with Ron, he's in charge of obviously being the lead attorney in the criminal uh, litigation, but I come in and explain the compliance issues that may be there or they may not be there. With Ron Sr., every time we issue a legal opinion, our policy is that two attorneys have to review the legal opinion and we have to, both of them, both of us agree, and then we confirm that the legal opinion pursuant to our principles and what we're looking for is acceptable and it can be issued to the client. Other thing that I, I, I don't do that that much anymore, but I used to do licensing. Um, we, do, we do a lot of audits, uh, like this client that was gonna purchase uh, the DME, if we were to purchase and get a letter of investigation or an overpayment, we defend against private insurance, public and Medicaid. And um, we work together. Sometimes I don't know everything. We work with toxicology lab, pharmacies, medical group, imaging centers. And if I don't know it, I just pick up the phone and talk to Ron, talk to we dad, talk to Ron the second. And that's how we work. We want to be the most cost effective for our clients. So sometimes I don't want to spend four hours of research when I can contact Ron, Ron can send an email. He knows basically that area. And then we save our clients a lot of money in research because another attorney specializes in that area. So 
So I think that's the way that we work at the firm. I think we try to be the most cost effective. Also, many times we use consultants because our hourly rate could be pretty, you know, exp not, not for us. We believe that we're worth every penny, but a, a consultant can pay a flat fee for $1,000 where that could be two hours of our time. So we will say, hey, use this healthcare consultant to do the chow application, to get third party payer agreements. And we try to be the most reasonable that we can with the client and always be upfront, let them know what to expect and obviously be, be fair with our billing and our retainer. But again, I have to, I have to basically, and I know Kristen because uh, she was my, my counselor and, and it was a great experience meeting her. And, and the Loyola program is, is off the charts. I, I think it's what makes me the real attorney that I am today. Not only because like Ron said, we only do healthcare, that's your specialty. If we were to do divorce or, or medical malpractice and all of that, then maybe you're good in something, but you're not, you're not great at what you do. And I think because we just focus on healthcare and all of us have the LLM, uh, that allows us to basically focus on what we like, we like to do and provide the best advice for our clients. Yeah, the depth of your firm is very impressive. You have so much really a specialty and expertise in so many areas. It really sounds like you work so well together. Um, and, and what you're doing now, you describe so, so much of our coursework in the corporate transactional area. We have a real specialty in compliance, um, in audits and risk management. These are all specialties of our health law program, which is the highest ranked um, program at Loyola's university broadly my knowledge. So we really have one of the very best, you know, always usually top five right now, ranked top three LLM program in health law in the country. And your firm is really capitalizing on so much of that knowledge, which is amazing. I'd love to hear from Ron about uh, your practice area and how your career path came to be and sort of a little bit about how the LLM degree helps you serve your clients. Yeah, absolutely. First, I have a confession to make. I didn't know that I wanted to be a lawyer until I was just, I, I would say, starting starting college or maybe uh, maybe my sophomore year in college. Most people would think having a, a father who's practiced law for a long time, I'd be gunning for it. But all I wanted to do was play hockey when I was younger. And that's all I <laughs> thought about. Um, I took a philosophy of law class my sophomore year, I think, and found out that I just absolutely fell in love with the law and I understand what or understood what my, my dad saw when I was growing up. Um, so I entered the Marine Corps uh, and I'd already had a contract um, and I decided to transition that contract into becoming a Marine Corps lawyer. So I could basically be sort of the Kevin Bacon from um, A Few Good Men. I spent some time in the courtroom there, ultimately deployed to Afghanistan where a lot of what I did involved investigations. Um, and that's where I really fell in love with the concept of getting out there and getting the facts, not from a law enforcement perspective, but from a legal perspective. Um, so when I came home, um, there were a few options for me, continue with government employment through the Marine Corps, or maybe the US Attorney's Office, or come and work in private practice. And at that point, I'd really had enough of uh, the government at that time and prosecution work, and I was looking to start some defense work. And so we, we spoke and uh, realized that there was um, an, an untapped area of the law in um, subject matter criminal defense experts. So in cases like tax violations or in cases like securities law violations, you have defense attorneys, white collar defense attorneys who are very knowledgeable in those areas. But with the rise in healthcare fraud prosecutions across the United States, there wasn't really a core of attorneys who were stepping up to the challenge with the right healthcare knowledge. And after working with a few um, well-known criminal defense attorneys in this area closely, I realized that because they were confused about the regulations, about the safe harbors that apply to the anti-kickback statute or other regulations, their clients were somewhat defenseless because the tools that were supposed to be there to defend them, the attorneys didn't know about. And so after advising a few of those attorneys on proper strategies, we decided to jump in the ring ourselves as a firm. And that was in about 2013, 2014. And now we've got a, a great white collar defense practice that's uh, got a national reputation, I would say, Megan's on the team. We have Jonathan Meltz down in Florida and then Summer McKeever out in Los Angeles. And they're all very talented um, healthcare technicians. They understand criminal defense law and they understand healthcare law. 
and they can apply those skills in the courtroom. And we found that our clients have a competitive advantage over, um, over any other defendant in the courtroom because we're able to dive into the medicine. We're able to make novel arguments that haven't been made before. We're able to keep a judge's attention uh, with the law and the arguments that we're making. Um, and it's been quite successful. And another area we're able to apply that healthcare knowledge in is internal investigations. So commonly a large healthcare entity uh, realizes that there's trouble. Maybe there's a hotline complaint or a whistleblower complaint. And the first thing they do is they reach out to their counsel. Many times their counsel doesn't have the knowledge and experience to grab an investigation team and conduct an investigation. And Kristen, as I'm sure you're aware, um, Department of Justice guidance, chapter eight in the sentencing guidelines, which I heard about a lot when I was at Loyola, um, and recent 2020 DOJ guidance requires that to have an effective compliance program, you must have the ability to investigate, whether that's internally or externally. You need to have reporting, you need to have the ability to investigate, and then you need to have the ability to take proactive measures in response to what you find. And what we do for our clients is we dive into the, the issue. We find out who's responsible. We gather evidence and preserve it for litigation if the DOJ comes knocking. And then we also give them the right information so that they can move forward and solve the problem. It doesn't always mean reporting under the, um, the voluntary you know, reporting requirements because sometimes that's not a good idea for a client. Uh, sometimes it means holding that information, taking corrective action and leaning forward and getting ready for litigation. So what we've created for our clients is a team of very talented attorneys. And in fact, each of the white collar defense attorneys that we have on this team have independent experience different from mine that we can use to, to bring into that team and create uh, a much stronger cohesive unit that can go out there and investigate anywhere. Uh, Megan is a, uh, a former prosecutor and worked in Wayne County, which is probably one of the most difficult counties to work in in the state of Michigan, if not one of the most difficult in the country. I would think it's probably similar to Cook County in the volume of cases and issues that you have to deal with. And her ability to handle a heavy caseload, to investigate many cases herself, to have contact with law enforcement entities and really get into those fact-finding inquiries has been valuable for the team. Um, Jonathan Meltz, uh, who's down in Florida with us, is a, um, a state law attorney primarily, has done some federal work and was ready to transition into the healthcare world because he, he'd done pretty much about everything in the state world. He'd had large trials, he defended murder cases, um, everything from drunk driving through the entire range of offenses. And his talent in the courtroom and the number of trials that he has is really unmatched at our firm. And then we've got Summer who has done nothing but federal work, um, really I think since she got out of law school other than a short stint in the entertainment industry. Um, and she's just one of the most fantastic federal defense attorneys that. Uh, that I've seen and uh, she's continuing to do wonderful work there. We also have a range of other experts that we routinely work with. If you need an anesthesiologist to analyze um, an injection case to determine whether or not we're meeting the LCDs or the NCDs for facet joint injections, for instance, I, I can pick up the phone and call an expert immediately. If we need a former DEA diversion investigator to go into a pharmacy quickly for us and, and figure that out, Juan and I are in contact with a gentleman who does fantastic work for us and can go down there and get that. So we can pluck different professionals from different areas and have them ready on the spot for a quick investigation. Um, and it's been a really good line of work. We work now with a number of large entities. I can't name specific clients, but we've got a few uh, larger clients who've tapped us to conduct internal investigations. And we've been able to give them actual results, actual solutions, and a plan of action, which is much better than the typical of what we saw years ago of just sort of sweeping the issue under the rug. The DOJ doesn't tolerate that anymore and you have to have an aggressive investigation arm. Now, the thing that Loyola really helped me out with, and I think probably the same is true for Megan as well, is when we jump into a, a very unfamiliar area of healthcare, because let's be honest, as, as Ron Sr. said, you can't know every area of healthcare, right? It's, it's almost impossible. But what we do know, and I think Donald Rumsfeld talks about the known unknown in his book, is, is we, we know what we don't know, as Ron Sr. said before, all right? So we can look at the entire area of healthcare, we can boil it down to an area, and we can select from a menu what tools we're going to use to be able to solve that problem and get in touch with the right people to do it for us. Whereas many people may just simply be ignorant that there is an issue here, we know there is one and we can find the way to solve it. 
Um, Loyola gave me that 30,000 foot top down view of the entire area of healthcare so that I can really now take that look, take those same eyes and, and look into a business and find the problem and then get in touch with Juan or Wadad or Ron Sr. to collaborate with them on the compliance issues and the specific healthcare issues. And I really enjoyed seeing this team come together over the last few years, um, seeing everybody develop their own individual skills. Juan's fantastic with DEA issues. Wadad is a very talented civil lawyer and can deal with some of the collateral civil issues. And then Megan has just a tremendous amount of state law prosecution knowledge and also the LLM. So she has very specific healthcare knowledge. And, and Ron Sr. with his 37 years maybe of practicing, of practicing law uh, is just an encyclopedia of not only tactics, but, but good law. Um, it's been fun and I look forward to the future and we look forward to working with um, many more loyal LLM graduates. They're top notch. And uh, thank you for all the work you've been doing, Kristen. Thank you for that overview and sharing about your career path. That was wonderful. One thing that's really fun about health law is that it's incredibly dynamic and it changes all the time as everyone's described, but you're right. Having those tools to understand the landscape and how it all fits together is really beneficial and something you really can't have if you haven't studied health law in particular, which I think is amazing. And it's one of the most um, regulated areas uh, of business in the country. And that's great because it's a, it means jobs for health lawyers for many, many, many years to come. Um, Megan, I'd love to hear from you about your perspective on the degree and um, the transition you made in your career and, and how that's uh, served you and your clients. Sure, thank you, Professor Finn. So while I was in law school, I had the opportunity to take a, a short intro to health law elective class, and I really enjoyed it, but I knew it was really only uh, skimming the surface of health law. At the time, I also had an interest in criminal law, and I thought it would be really interesting to be able to combine um, both of those interests. But before I felt like I would be prepared to do so, I felt like I needed to gain some more knowledge um, you know, in health law itself. So that's when I enrolled in the LLM program at Loyola um, and I graduated in 2017. I still remember the first day of my LLM uh, courses, walking into class and having um, a conversation, I think it was an intro to health law, about um, the uniqueness of healthcare and how healthcare is a service that everyone at one point in their lives is going to utilize, whether it's from something as minor as, you know, seeing a physician to, you know, check out a sprained ankle, you know, to a major operation. It's something that impacts all of our lives. And now as a, a criminal defense attorney specializing in healthcare law, my, my job, of course, is focused on defending my individual client who uh, you know, is often a physician or a nurse practitioner. However, um, you know, the implications for the prosecution that they're facing, it really, um, it really has larger implications for all of us and for the practice of medicine and how the prosecution of that particular case um, will impact the practice of medicine and then impact all of us as future patients, really. And I think like Loyola gave me the, the, um, the skills not only to understand the substantive law and the, the statutes and the cases that might apply to my client's cases, but also to be able to look at the big picture and to think critically about these issues and their implications. Uh, you know, while this isn't an argument uh, that I could necessarily bring to a jury talking about, you know, healthcare and, and the policy and all of that, uh, it's something that I find, you know, very fascinating. And I think that it's important um, in helping to prepare a case and in preparing strategy and understanding why necessarily the government is pursuing this prosecution, what their goals are um, in prosecuting this particular client. You know, also looking at it from my client's perspective and understanding what it's like for them as a provider and how, how this prosecution is going to affect uh, their livelihood 
and what they're hoping to, to gain out of the process, whether you know that's taking the case all the way to trial or if it's reaching a resolution short of trial and understanding um, how healthcare impacts many areas um, of our lives um, was something that I did learn from Loyola and which is helpful in navigating these, these cases and you know, thinking outside of the box and not just looking at, okay, what is the next step in this criminal process, but looking at the, the bigger picture um, in terms of, of health law. Of course, what we've already said many times is that this is such a specialized area and that's sort of the flip side. While healthcare affects all of us in some way, it's also so specialized in terms of the education that it takes for you know, healthcare providers to, to understand and to navigate that it's hard for someone um, coming in as an attorney to really understand just you know, the abbreviations or um, you know, the terms that these providers are using. And when I decided to sort of go back into um, you know, the healthcare uh, industry after taking some time to uh, pursue my interests in, in criminal law, um, you know, I really found that that education at Loyola made me a little bit more comfortable when I was looking at these cases, when I saw, uh, you know, some of these, these familiar terms on an indictment, looking at things like healthcare fraud and anti-kickback law. Um, I remember spending a significant amount of time, you know, speaking about um, these specific laws in um, in some of my courses there and not looking only looking at the statute, but the case law um, that followed and just being able to, to be familiar and to be able to navigate, navigate those laws um, is something that I feel is so helpful as a health law attorney that you're not just seeing those statutes for the first time when you're getting the indictment on your client, uh, which you know, it's probably the case for a lot of attorneys who you know, haven't had this, you know, this opportunity to, to spend so much time diving into healthcare law. And in terms of my other courses that sort of played into my ability to navigate these cases, um, I found those skills to be so helpful as well. Um, not only looking at, you know, the substantive law, but also looking at the implications um, you know, from, you know, compliance or healthcare, business and finance, and you know, seeing the, whether these clients, you know, do they have any valid defenses? What was their compliance program like? You know, is that something that is going to hurt them or help them um, in, the, in, the, in the prosecution of this case? Um, you know, looking at, you know, what kinds of business dealings were they in? You know, how are those dealings, um, you know, structured? Um, you know, understanding, um, you know, Medicare payment and reimbursement. That's something that is highly, highly technical. And I, you know, still don't claim to be an expert in that at all, but just to have some degree of familiarity is so important because these cases um, that are related to violations of federal and sometimes state law uh, related to healthcare fraud and abuse um, are highly technical and they come with, uh, voluminous discovery, not only looking at medical records, but also billing information, um, you know, and, and all of that information is, is difficult to, to navigate, but having um, the skills uh, that I gained from Loyola, it definitely gives me uh, a place to start and some framework for, for going about that. And also, you know, the ability to, to look at these issues critically and to, to see um, you know, how they're really impacting um, the practice of medicine, not just for my particular clients, but for, um, you know, the future of our, you know, our society really as a whole. I love that. I love the broader view that you described of, you know, being able to see holistically how your individual health law practice affects all of our medicine and our, our structure really in, in health law broadly. I think that's really wonderful that you were able to have that view and uh, that sort of 30,000 foot perspective. I also love that you described how having the familiarity with the terminology is so important. And I think 
really educating yourself in that realm um, can be beneficial too. I'd love to hear from we dad about as a current LLM student, how, how it's helping your, you and your practice already and, um, and how that's going. Absolutely. Thanks, Professor Finn. Um, really happy to be with such great company, frankly. Um, I'm graduating in about six weeks or so. And I say that because I know how much work I have left to do in these next six weeks, but I am very much looking forward to finally um, getting the LLM and being able to utilize all of the education and all the knowledge that I've you know, crammed in in these past year and a half or so. I'm in the online LLM program and just a little bit of background. I never ended up or thought I'd end up practicing healthcare law. I went to law school um, on a pretty simple solution, which was my parents wanted, and I'm an Arab American, my parents and the community usually wants their kids to become doctors, which I'm sure can kind of be commonplace for a lot of <laughs> uh, parents. So. I wasn't particularly great at science or math, so to speak. And so I said, huh, lawyer sounds pretty good. Um, and it has you know, the, the same kind of proudness that your parents can say, well, hey, my kid's a lawyer. So I just chose it out of the blue. Um, and then I went to Michigan State for law school and I was very focused on becoming a practical uh, litigator, whether that was in the criminal field or the civil field, I wasn't too sure in law school, but I loved being in front of the jury, uh, doing mock trials, going to competitions and just getting out there and speaking about the law. And that's really where um, I think my passion lies. I love research and writing, but um, I love you know, much more so being in front of the judge and getting asked such difficult questions and just having to like think of it on the spot. I think it's so exciting. And it's great that I work here because uh, Ron Sr. pretty much does that to me like every day. So um, it works out pretty well. So um, I get out of law school and I take a uh, general civil litigation job where I'm working in federal court. And I exclusively have been practicing federal litigation since. So once I made the transition from that job, I found Chapman Law Group, saw they were in healthcare, wasn't like, I'm like, okay, that sounds nice. Um, but once I got here, I realized, holy cow, I think I just found my career. Um, but the striking point was while I knew the general uh, steps as a first year uh, attorney of filing your pleadings, responding, knowing the federal rules of civil procedure um, in working on these medical malpractice and deliberate indifference cases starting off, uh, working with Ron Senior, I got to see the uh, 360 view that he can bring to a case that I felt I was quite limited in only because I never took a healthcare law course in law school altogether. Uh, I just brought in my general um, law legal career and legal knowledge with me, but bringing in that healthcare expertise, I could easily see how he could take a medical malpractice issue and say, oh, well, you know, um, not providing medications is very similar to this case where even though it's a compliance case, he can take a lot of that knowledge saying, well, pharmacists have an independent um, requirement to verify medication. And that can be applied here because that's why, you know, we need to go through these different steps of med verification in the correctional facility. So, I mean, he took two different worlds and kind of can bridge the gap. And I said, hey, well, I want to do that too. So um, I uh, spoke with Ron at, uh, Sorry, Ron, I was about to call you Ron too. I spoke with Ron and then he really encouraged me to do it, uh, to go in and just start the degree. I was worried about balancing uh, career, family and work, but that's one of the most fantastic things about the online program. And that's what I always tell people is you can do it. Uh, you can have a family, you can go to school, you can work full time. Um, it's challenging, but if you're willing to do it, you can. And the great thing is you're with colleagues in your classes that have the similar kind of lifestyle. You're with doctors, you're with risk management directors with just as busy lifestyles and um, they're doing it too. So you feel like you're in a community of colleagues that understands that you know we're not just students, um, we're also practitioners in the real world and we also have real world pressures on us as well. So you feel like you, you really aren't alone in that sense. Um, because I've, I've done it before where I tell, hey, Professor Desheen, I mean, I was in depth all week and I need uh, some extra time on this, on this module essay. And he's like, okay, sure. 
Um, so I just love the real world uh, lens that Loyola gives to their students. You're not just a student, they understand uh, the pressures of being an attorney or another professional in their respective careers. So um, as a new and up and, up and coming grad, I think my biggest challenge that I've been kind of mulling over is transitioning from being just a litigator to being a healthcare attorney that works in other areas like compliance with Juan um, and Ron Sr. Um, as a litigator, I typically get the complaint, right? And it tells me all the issues. So I don't really need to spot them because they've already been kind of identified by the plaintiff. And in that, in that case, now I'm just going into investigation, defense mode, and pretty much figuring out all the different ways that I can protect my client. In compliance, that's not the case at all. <laughs> I'm getting a, a call saying, hey, I'm thinking about opening up a home health care. What does that really mean? And then that's the onus is on me now to use my knowledge from Loyola, figure out, OK, well, that's going to bring in a lot of different regulatory aspects to it. Let's talk to Juan about corporate transactions and getting you the right structure that works well for you. And let's talk about your compliance program and, you know, and all these different things. And so you're not only identifying problems for clients, you're also identifying potential problems. And as a litigator, I'm just used to, OK, we have the problem, so let's go ahead and solve it. So I think that's going to be my biggest challenge uh, going in into some of these cases is realizing, OK, I might not know everything, as we've talked about, but I know enough to get me in the right direction. And the great thing is I have five people on speed dial to uh, ask all these different questions for that I think is what makes Chapman Law Group so special and so unique. Um, I don't think that you can find another healthcare focused law firm with so many specialized attorneys uh, working in very specific areas and becoming those experts in those areas, um, which is why I'm, I'm looking forward to figuring out what exactly my niche might be um, at, in terms of uh, what I can bring to the firm. I think that a big area that I think we're going to see a lot more of deals with cybersecurity, HIPAA, high tech, all of those different issues, especially with how COVID has really highlighted a lot of the challenges in delivering healthcare to people when we were all subject to being home or being remote in some respects. Um, cybersecurity in the healthcare field is actually a big problem that the Health and Human Services Department has highlighted, saying that um, oftentimes they are the subjects of uh, data, data breaches hackers, all these different aspects that it's not just enough to be HIPAA compliant anymore. It's you have to do more in, to, in order to protect your protected health information, your patients, all these different aspects that I think we're going to see a lot of different new regulations come about that I'd like to kind of delve into and figure out how and, um, you know, get, a, get ahead of what the government is um, trying to get and look into so we can help out our clients in that respect. So that'd be something I really look forward to kind of doing and, and learning more about. But I, I mean, I can't speak enough about how great the program is, um, how great the professors are. And frankly, just the fact that I have this specialized knowledge now and can move forward fairly early in my career and build upon that is, is probably one of the best decisions that I've made um, because, I mean, there's, there's benefits either way to coming into Loyola, having been practiced for 30, you know, 25 years, and there's the benefit of having done it two, three years into your career. So I have the benefit of seeing both in action and um, just really looking forward to working more with Loyola, future grads, pot potential interns, uh, however we can possibly uh, help the, the program that really helped us. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, our, our most recent full-time faculty hire specializes in cybersecurity, data protection. Um, that's really her area. So we have continued to expand our knowledge base, our professors, um, our resources in terms of where the intersection of medicine and technology is. I think you're right. That seems to be a real area for expansion. Um, so that, that's definitely an exciting area to watch, but I'm so proud of you. You're graduating in just six years. And you, um, you get to, to really focus on um, how this is gonna work in your practice, which is really exciting. Um, another thing that I heard everyone mention is how great it is to have this network of other Loyola LLMs and even your professors moving forward. Um, look what it's done for your firm. 
and hopefully for our graduates for many years in the future. Um, I wanna thank you all for letting me be a part of this wonderful session. I learned a lot about your practice areas and how um, the degree has helped you. And uh, Chapman Law Group sounds like a really great place to work. So thank you very much for um, letting me participate. Thank you. thank you so much, Professor Thanks. Finn. And one thing I'll say in closing, every time I see things like this, I'm amazed at the wonderful people we have, that the skills Ron has, what Dodd has, Megan. Um, you know, you see them every day in the hall and you're just talking about issues. And, and here you get to hear, you know, a little bit of their life story, how they came to things. Um, there was a time about 25 years ago, I thought if I just cloned myself about 10 or 12 times, I'd have the most awesome firm in the world. And then I woke up one day and I thought, that's just a terrible idea just absolutely terrible. And then I look around today and we have such a diverse group. I mean, this, just a, this is a less than a third of our firm. People come from all walks of life, nationalities, religions, different previous jobs, all kinds of things. And they all bring a different perspective. And I think that's the great thing of having a diverse group. Um, I see things through a different eye than Juan sees them, than Megan, than Wadad, than Ron. Um, and that different perspective is always good. And that was good in Loyola classes. Everybody came in with a different one. Um, I was told I was always the antagonist that, uh, you know, got everybody mad at me and got everybody talking. But in the talking, good ideas come out and different perspectives come out. And, and that's what we try to do here. We really try to have a collegial environment where everybody's opinions respected. Um, may not always be taken. My opinion isn't always taken, but it's respected and that helps us sharpen the best approach for the client to help them out of trouble. And the one thing that keeps all of our clients together, they went to school for a long time. Their families are dependent on their ability to earn an income. And sometimes they come to us very naively like, you know, my partners and I are thinking on opening a sleep clinic and we're all going to refer work to it and, and everything's going to be great. And we're like, whoa, put the brakes on there because um, you may just end yourself up in jail and we help them there. And then the ones that come to us because they innocently got involved in something and now they're facing an indictment. They came from a country where it's okay to pay somebody $500 for something. And now they realize that that's a crime here when you're dealing with healthcare. And it's sad. Um, 37 years and my heart still breaks every time I see a good doctor, a good practitioner, a good nurse practitioner, whatever, that started doing it for the right reasons. And then bad things happened. And now they've lost a career. Their family can't be supported. They're going to jail. They're on probation. Um, and we try to help that on both ends before it happens. And of course we have great people for after it happens. So, um, and we owe a lot of that to Loyola and a lot of that just because the men and women that are here and the other ones, they love the law. Um, and that's something you don't see in a lot of lawyers. I mean, we have the passion for law. I ask a lot of lawyers, I say, look, is this a profession or a job? If they say it's a job, I don't want them. Get as far away from me as you can. But if it's a profession and you really take it on as a profession, you care about your client, you care about continuing to learn, you care about finding out what you don't know, whether it's an LLM or just taking a three-day course that's offered by the American Health Law um, Association or whatever, um, those are the people we want. And these are the people that are here and the other ones that we have that, that don't have um, LLMs. And I will say one last thing too. Wadad is actually a recipient of our first kind of quasi scholarship. When she graduates, she gets a significant amount of money and then she gets additional money every year for the next four years. We're not paying for a degree, but we're certainly going to offset. And we offer that to our students here, or not our students, our lawyers here that might want to go. Um, because we think it's, it's very important. And we have a couple really good ones that are thinking about it that have proven to be really good. And um, I guess that's proof of how we think Loyola. And they don't get that if they go to another LLM program. They only get that if they go to Loyola. So thank you so much for being here, for helping us. And 
um, you know, being the, the moderator here, we've really enjoyed it.